do you win and thrive in a digitally transformed post-pandemic world? A question we're going to explore in this episode of Business Without Barriers, the show bringing you powerful strategies to turn barriers into success breakthroughs and thrive in a volatile world, the show bringing humanity back to business. I'm your host, Carmen Wild, and today my guest is Herman Singh, CEO of Future Advisory and Professor at the University of Cape Town and Johannesburg. He serves on numerous university faculties and is non-executive director on a number of boards. Herman's academic background is in engineering and his career spans the fields of manufacturing, consulting, advisory work, turnarounds and e-commerce. In 2000, as director of online services and e-commerce at Standard Bank, he led the bank's foray into internet banking, spearheading a number of firsts, such as deploying one of the first platforms in the world and one of the first African fintech business incubators for the group. In 2012, Herman moved into the telecommunications space, where he launched business initiatives attracting revenues of over a billion rand within four years of startup. Herman is the author of Devolution, an essential guide to winning in a digitally transformed post-pandemic environment and the focus of today's discussion. A very warm welcome to you, Herman. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. It's wonderful to be here. And hello to, to all your viewers and listeners. Awesome. So just let me get that right. How do you pronounce that name of your, the name of your book? Is it right? Devolution? It depends on which country you're from. The guys in the states say divolution. Divolution. But then you know, you know, and they. But then if if, if they ask for directions, they do ask for routes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, devolution, divolution, whatever works for you. The, the original um, source of the word is digital yes. evolution. So I guess devolution is probably the closest. Perfect. Okay. So. I believe we're in for a power hour. One of the comments on your LinkedIn profile is, listening to Herman is like drinking water from a fire hose. <laughs> and I can attest to that after reading your book. So tell me what fire hose did you drink from when you, to write a book of this nature, you must have been drinking from some fire hose. So what hose was that? <laughs> So uh, it's a lovely question. I, I, I really, it's a question around inspiration, I guess. A I, I, couple of things. Look, one is, um, you know, I my career was very much spending half of my life building the industrial infrastructure of Africa and South Africa, managing director at Siemens for a long time, and so as an engineer. And then I spent a half, the second half of my career building the commercial infrastructure of Africa and South Africa, from internet banking to telcos to e-commerce. So I have this very unusual and unique perspective on the world because I'm also an academic. And so, you know, I've, I've taught 50,000 students at business schools in my career. And so I, I got to thinking about this and I was been watching the waves come. And I guess, you know, it was, co I, I started writing the book before COVID. And the more I started kind of capturing my thoughts and my ideas, the more I, I began to realize that the man in the street didn't understand this. I, I kept getting asked the question, Herman, what should I do with my career? You know, I coach a lot of people. What should I do with my career? I mean, not formally, I'm not an official coach, but people phone me and ask me for advice. What should I do with my career? What should I study? What should I tell my students to study? Where should I take my company? I decided just to capture this and sell it in a book. And that's really what drove it. And, and then along came COVID. And I've been trying to get this book published. I've written to about 70 different publishers. They all said no. And this was all pre-COVID, right? Then after COVID, I had this flood of people saying, please, can we have a book? By then, I'd already published it on, on Amazon. So basically, in a sense, it was a bit before its time. Uh, went onto Amazon, became an Amazon bestseller in the first two months. So it was really great. And, um, but inspired, I guess, by the fact that I could see the gap that existed in humanity and I just tried to fill it. Fantastic. And that's exactly how we succeed. We look for those problems before anyone else actually knows it's a problem and fill the gap. Mm. How did the book evolve as the pandemic took hold? Because you were writing the book in 2019. Did it, did the pandemic influence some of it or were you already like, yeah. I, I would say that I probably changed 30, 30 to 40 percent of the book changed okay. and it, it, it changed in the sense that I added more content I didn't change what I'd already written so the, 
I'd, I I'd went out and I said, how long should a, a business book be? I had no idea how long a business book should. Went to Google and Professor Google said 50 or 40,000 words. So I wrote a, a book of 40,000 words. And then along came the pandemic and it grew to 60, 65,000. And basically I just kept adding to it. Um, and so the pandemic did influence it in the sense that in a way, the future arrived early. That's kind of what happened here, right? Things we were expecting to happen in eight years, like everyone's going to be working from home. The forecast in 2019 was by 2030, 80% of people will be working from home. That was a forecast, right? Uh, well, you know, halfway through April, we, we don't really hit the forecast. Uh, people I spoke to in the ISP industry said to me, Herman, we've used up two years worth of bandwidth that we thought we had as kind of um, as a ceiling. We, we had some space. They said we used it up. E-commerce companies were saying to me they did three years worth of growth in three months. So that basically is, is what happened. So the book basically um, it describes a world that arrived sooner than kind of I'd been expecting it to. And, and so people thought they had more time to change. Yes. Actually, they didn't. And a lot of people were caught flat, flat-footed by this. Wow. And, and amazing that we have a book like this to help us right when we need it, not after, after the fact. So... Well done to you and congratulations on being ahead of the curve and bringing to the world a book of this nature. I mean, it's so filled with gems and, and it, it, it's, a, it's a scary read in the first half of the book and then an enlightening and like, whew, okay, cool, we can do this. There's opportunities. <laughs> so got lighter at the end. Tell us from, from your perspective what devolve means. Yeah, so, so really the, the challenge you, you have in the world is, is a concept that was developed by a professor called Joseph Schumpeter in uh, the early part of the last century. He, he used the term uh, creative destruction. And it's a lovely term and it's a scary term. Mm -hmm. And creative destruction it's almost like a mind exploding concept, right? On the one hand, we talk about things being created. On the other hand, we talk about things being destroyed. And that really is what devolving and devolution is. You, what you're doing is you are, you are creating new things that eat up the old things. Hmm. And the, the challenge that we've got is so much of the world today is built on the old things. Yes. And then along came this amazing technology that allows us to, to take something that took a hundred minutes and do it in 10 seconds, hmm. you know? And now, I mean, this is not, you know, a five or 10% productivity improvement. This is, this is catastrophic if that was your job. Hmm. It's amazing if you're a consumer and it's scary if you're a business. And so that is the challenge we've got here is, is in, in a weird way, devolve is a lot like evolution, except what happens is with, with evolution, you constantly kind of building up, you exposing yourself to the environment and it's driven by environmental factors. What's happening here is an astonishing exponential growth in the capability of technology. And it becomes totally unpredictable as to what the next thing is going to be. I mean, let me give you an example. In 2010, the board of Standard Bank, right? And let me just tell you who, who was on the board. On the board of Standard Bank was Mamfele Ramfele, was um, a, a, a young man that very few people had heard of called Cyril Ramaphosa. And, right? And, and so the board of Standard Bank, chaired by Jerry Cooper, said, Herman, we're a bit worried about where the world's going. Come and spend two days with us at the Westcliff and walk us through your view on where the world's going. So for two days, I produced like 300 slides. And I was hammering them on the fact that this new thing was going to change the world. It was social. It was about sharing information, photographs, music, tastes. And so it was amazing. I mean, what's the name of this thing? And I said, MySpace. <laughs> and so you, know, you can't predict it because in 2010 Facebook was nowhere and so, and, so, and so the challenge that you have you know even Uber didn't exist in 2008 hmm. so, so the challenge you have is the world we have today was difficult to predict 10 years ago yes. and I guess in, in a sense devolve is, it's difficult to predict, predict where the world's going what we do know is technology is on a path that can't be stopped and this technology is basically going to take things that were manual and automate them. And it's going to free up people to do other things. And in particular, it's going to dramatically lower the cost of doing business, lower barriers to entry. And for me, it's going to introduce a golden world 
where we are going to have to fundamentally rewrite rules of society, right? We're going to rewrite rules of society because what is a job, really? What is work if, if robots and computers can do so much for us? And, you know, and, uh, and that for me is what Devolve is all about. It's about this kind of unpacking of businesses and processes and society and then reassembling it in a new, more efficient way. That's kind of what's happening here. And by the way, that's not how evolution works. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if evolution makes small incremental changes. Devolution is not like that. Okay, we're off to a great start. So let's look at the first sentence in your book that says, I read, oh, I quote, the world is at war with itself. No, not a war between nations. And then you go on to say, this is a war to end all wars, a war without precedent, no defined battlefield. And the end game is opaque. So I read those few words and I go, oh, hell. So tell us (laughs) about this war that we're in and why we we need to take it seriously and suit up. So so what's what's really happening in the world in a sense, right, is that you, you, you're in a war with the future. The future is actually pulling us forward. And in fact, what's just happened is we thought this, the big battle was going to occur in eight years' time. What is happening today? COVID and the pandemic has brought the war today. And we're seeing it today, right? We're seeing this massive adoption of digital technology. So the, the war that's happening is that we've, in a sense, we, we have these stormtroopers, which is basically the technology, it's mobile phones, it's SIM cards, it's chip cards, it's smart devices in cars, it's Facebook, it's Uber. It's all of these, I guess, forces that are basically fundamentally shaping the world and reshaping the world. Now, what is it fighting the war with? It's fighting the war with dogma. It's fighting the war with dominant logic, limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a bank, we don't do that kind of thing. We're a retailer, that's not what we do. It was not invented here. That's not how we do things around here. And so you've got this dogma from the past that says this is how we've always done it and it's always worked. And this this kind of positive reinforcement from old habits is what this war is being fought with. In a sense, it's almost the culture of business today. And what you've got are these forces from the future saying, I don't really care how much of money you've got invested in DVDs and CDs and warehouses and retail. I'm just going to deliver this music straight to my customer. And what I'm going to do is where you used to charge the customer $10, even though he only wanted one track on the album, I'm going to give him for $10, 20 million songs. And they fundamentally flipped this entire thing on its head. Consumers love this. If you're a legacy business, you're petrified by this, right? And technology makes this possible, but also fundamental and radical new business models. Because, you know, Spotify had to go and negotiate with the labels and say, I want to give all the songs away, and I'm only going to pay you per track listened to completely. Now, let me tell you, because my deal with with Amazon for this book is if you download this book on Amazon uh, Kindle Unlimited, I only get paid per page you read. I love this model, right? Because it means you better write good books, right? Don't write rubbish books. I'm going to read it. They'll buy it. They don't read it. Why should I get paid? I love it. And the same is true with artists making albums. If you make an album with 20 tracks and only one's good, well, I'm only going to pay you for that one. So I love it. So, so what's starting to happen is we, we're actually digging deep into the perverse incentives yeah. that, let, let's call it artificial profits, that have really irritated us as consumers. We're ripping them out. You know, banks charge us if we break our overdraft limit. Telcos charge us if we go out of bundle. You know, all of these stupid rules, uh, you, you get charged a premium if you want to change your airline ticket. They, they're basically rubbish. These rules are all being rewritten and they're being written for the better. So, so I have a very positive view of the future, but this war is, has got only one possible outcome. And we've got to get rid of all of this baggage that we carry from the past and embrace the, the new. Sure. And the way you've put it there, it, that's a war to be excited about. Because, yes, yeah. there- rules bullshit rules from the past the legacy the 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 stuff that you know people are scared of their futures but actually it's the stuff from the past that slows us down so let's get rid of all this baggage from the past and and you you spoke about a golden world i also i speak about a golden reset 
I think we're in a golden reset where we actually have an opportunity to completely destroy everything that's not working and move forward. Uh, yep. You've just you've got an amazing way of, of of really putting it down into well, this is the this is where we're at. So let's get excited about it rather than um, who wants bullshit rules anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So you, you speak about our current reality being like a platypus. I thought this was really interesting. So we re we're living in a reality that part bird, mammal, reptile, nothing flippant makes sense. How do, what's going to be the outcome? And maybe this is an obvious question, but I'd like it from your perspective. What's the outcome for someone just hoping this is going to pass? Oh, it's not going to pass. There's no passing here. Mm -hmm. They might be passing out, but there's no passing. So Look, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I've been speaking with, you know, some amazing people around the world, like, like yourself. I, what, what's great about writing a book is, you know, you get to talk to really interesting, smart people. Um, I was talking to Verizon, which is a $164 billion company. I spoke to their exco a week ago. Uh, two days ago, I spoke with the head of the organization that basically is an association of all the telcos in the world. Uh, this morning, I was talking to an agricultural business in Saudi Arabia. Next week, I'm talking to, you know, another telco in the Middle East. And I asked them the question, what is your expectation? Do you think we're getting back to normal? And it's really interesting. They said, you know, based, if I summarize it, business can't get, cannot recover until people do. Mm. And it's not about a physical recovery. It's an emotional recovery. We are scared. You know, people don't want to go out. We're scared. We have a danger we cannot see. That's what makes us so freaky, right? Yeah. We can't see this thing. If it was a wild dog you know, roaming around, we could avoid this thing. And this is the problem with all of, all of the Hollywood movies. It was always an enemy that you could see. Yeah. Now we've got an enemy we can't see. Mm -hmm. And we, none of us were prepared for this by, by Hollywood. And what's very clear is until we have a proven vaccine and you know, we've all got it. Uh, we, we are not going up. There's no going back to normal. Uh, looking at the big airlines in the world, they're all, they're all predicting 2024. If they're lucky, they'll get back to 2019 numbers. That's five years. So the world's lost five years. And I, I don't know if you're going to get back to normal because here's the problem. If you look at the cruise ship industry, you know, 50% of the capacity of cruise ships is being cut up in Greece as we speak. That capacity is being taken out of the market. It's not coming back. There's no going back for cruise ships. And cruise ships, remember, they've always been floating petri dishes, right? They've, you know, it's been a, it's been a nightmare. Cruise ships, everybody I've spoken to on a cruise ship gets sick, and they all get gastro. It's a problem they've had for decades. They never solved it, and now it's come back to bite them. And so, you know, I, for me, the cruise ship industry is toast. The airline industry will come back, but we've retired a lot of planes. A lot of big planes have been retired. Prices are going to go up. And so in a, in a sense, the world we're gonna see in the future is gonna be very different to the world of the past. T airline tickets are gonna be more expensive. There's gonna be fewer people traveling. I, I actually question whether business class travel is ever gonna come back at the volumes we've seen because so many of us are doing what, what you and I are doing now, which is talking on Zoom. And you know, my boss is gonna say, why should I fly you to the United States if you can just hop on and have this kind of call? Okay. So, I, so my sense is, you know, people use this concept of, of new normal. Firstly, the concept of normal is wrong. There is never a normal. Mm -hmm. We've been in constant change for you know, 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. The problem is we call it normal if there's been no major change for like five years or 10 years, that becomes normal, right? It's just a limited period of stability that we refer to as normal. Statistically, that is actually highly improbable that we're gonna have stableness. What's more likely to happen is we're gonna revert to a world of actually quite a lot of chaos, a lot of change, and I think that's going to be the, if you want to use the word normal, that's the normal, normal. constant change. Yes. And we need to get used to that. Okay. So if we're going to be in this accidental future, as you speak about, it's unpredictable, it's unstable, there's no control. What do you think the biggest barriers to success are that we need to get our heads around? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be embracing this uncertainty. And, um, you know, the, and I think that the barriers are really in our own heads, right? Because I think, you know, human potential is amazing. It's unlimited. You know, I had great fun writing that last chapter because in, in my mind, I think humans are capable of the most astonishing things. You know, I, I did a presentation this morning speaking about the fact that for tens or hundreds of thousands of years, 
you know, human wealth as we defined it didn't change. And then suddenly we stumbled onto coal and you know, oil and energy changed humanity. So I'm pretty sure that we're gonna find something else that's gonna change humanity. And so for me, the issue is how are we going to embrace what has happened? Because what's happening is not in our control. Up to now, everything's been in our control. This is one of the few things in the world that's completely out of our control. Number one, we don't know where technology is gonna to go to. Number two, we don't know where COVID and any other pandemic is gonna to go to. How do we adapt to this? Mm -hmm. uh, I have great faith in the ability of humanity to innovate and in the creative potential of, 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 of people. So I think we live in a universe of infinite possibilities. And I think that the longer we sit back and wait or, or engineer our lives to go back to what was here in 2019, the more we're gonna have our handbrakes on. What we've got to start doing is start to imagine what this world could be and the new potential. So I, yesterday, I ran a webinar and I interviewed the vice president uh, for the, for, of Uber for, um, for, the, for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. And I, I said to him, you know, I said, uh, what have you guys done? Because your, 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 your passenger numbers dropped in March by 95%. You know, airlines dropped by 90%. Now, how do you survive this? I said, I've looked at your numbers now, th this quarter, you guys are only down 30%, what did you do? He says, well, basically Uber has now pivoted to becoming a delivery company. We deliver everything. We deliver food, we deliver parcels. We, instead of taking people to food, we're taking food to people. And he said, the most amazing thing, today they announced in South Africa that they are now delivering medicines and pharmaceutical products to people. So I think what you're gonna see is Uber's gonna fundamentally shift. And that for me just, it typifies the kind of sheer potential humans have to pivot their business where the opportunity is. So we've got to basically assume we're all startups and we've got to get, we've got to rethink our product market fit. You've got to think like a startup. That's what we've got to do. Wow. Okay. Cool. As startups, what skills do we must, how must we skill up? So what, what do you so see? Also saying the barriers are mostly in our heads. So if we're yes. chaps in the barriers in our heads, where, what do you see as like maybe the three, five skills that are crucial yeah. to have? Fantastic, fantastic question, uh, Carmen. So, so, you know, the, the problem that you've got with normal is normal is actually, in my, in my head, normal is another word for laziness. It's complacency. Normal is this is how it is, right? I don't have to change anything. I eat here, I drive here. This is my route to work. This is my job. This is how I dress. That's what we call normal. Normal is complacent. Yes. Uh, and so I think we, you know, startups are not complacent. Startups do two things particularly well. The first thing they do is they spend a lot of time understanding where their customers are. So in other words, they, 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 they start off on the assumption, they make an assumption, okay, about the way they, they think the world works. This is called a, it's called a scientific method of thinking. You first make an assumption. Then what you do is you then conduct an experiment to check whether your assumption is right or wrong. Let me give you an example. If you go to a doctor and you present very unusual symptoms, uh, the doctor's gonna go, well, gee, I don't know what this is. This is very unusual. I'm gonna assume this is viral or bacterial or organ. He's gonna make an assumption. And they're not sure if they're right or not. They might be wrong. They'll then conduct some experiments to see, take this, you know, and if you're a witch doctor, take three lizards and call me in the morning. If you're a, you know, if you're a medical doctor from a medical school, you'll take three aspirins, whatever. And then you'll, <laughs> you'll Come back in the morning and say, well, it worked or it didn't work. So what do doctors do? Doctors test for symptoms, right? They develop a hypothesis. They conduct, I mean, you can't tell patients that you're conducting experiments, <laughs> but you're basically conducting an experiment. And then based on the outcome of the experiment, you apply a prescription. Now, this is exactly what startups do. Mm -hmm. Startups go out with, I think there's a market for, I don't know, online dog food. Uh, that's my hypothesis. I'm gonna conduct, and here's my, my symptoms are, people don't have time. Uh, South Africa's got the sixth biggest population of pets in the world. We've got the sixth biggest pet food market in the world. Everyone's busy, nobody wants to go out. I'm gonna launch a pet food business that delivers to their home. If you do this, by the way, you owe me 5% commission on that idea. Um, <laughs> and so, 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 so you got a hypothesis, right? You got data, it's symptoms. You then say, I think I could build a business. What do you, what do, you do then? The third thing you do, so step one, I'm open to symptoms. Step two, I build a hypothesis. Step three, I conduct an experiment. I go out and I say, I'm gonna build a small website. I'm gonna to go to my friends and family. 
get to some of their friends and family, get like a thousand people, build this website, try it out, conduct an experiment, gather data, figure out whether I was right or wrong, learn and measure and then learn, then go back and change my hypothesis. And then I will do this a thousand times a year until finally I land on something that works. Now, let's go through that process because this is what I think everyone's gonna to have to do. And by the way, it applies to your career, it applies to kids schooling, it applies to your business, your family life, etc. What are we missing? The first thing we've done is we've stopped listening to symptoms, we've stopped listening to signals, we're not paying attention to drivers, we're not listening to customers. Your first thing you've got to do is start assuming that you know nothing. Start, and this is the problem with complacency, we assume we know everything. That's what normal means. Now you've got to assume you know nothing. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to say, based on the signals I'm, I've got, what is my hypothesis? Well, that requires creativity. Mm. And many of us have parked the creativity bus the minute we turn 15. Right, because you know we had permission to play when we were children. I'm giving everyone permission to play again. You really need to be playing, right? Because children do this naturally, and then somehow we turn 15, and then we get the judge, the judgment of our peers, and suddenly it's about I've got a I've got a 15 year old son. It's about hair and teeth and pimples and yeah, judgment, and then we alter our behavior. We got to go back to pre-teens, right? And then we conduct those experiments, build the hypothesis, creativity and then conduct those experiments. And we've got to give ourselves permission to play, but we've got to give ourselves permission to fail. Mm. And, and companies have to learn to do this. We've got to give our staff permission to fail, permission to play. And then what you then have to do is to say, well, people are taking huge risks with their careers. You know, I, I built some amazing things for big corporates, but every time I did it, I put my career on the line and I could have lost my job and I would have never worked again. I don't know if I was lucky or good, but. I was one of the guys that always put my hand up and said, I'll build the first internet bank, the third internet bank in the world, you know, I'll build the first partnership between a telco and a bank. I'll, I'll roll out smart cards in South Africa. We'll roll out the, you know, mobile money, whatever, you know, and, and I was lucky. I had good bosses who supported me, but the problem that you have is now you're going to have to take what I didn't do it a million times. So, you know, all the bosses are going to have to change their behavior, right? Mm. And staff are going to have to be encouraged to take this, these risks. And you can't fire them if they fail because they were doing what you need them to do. And failure is a good thing, right? It's just an accelerated way of learning. And once you find something that really works, you must double down on that. And I think that's the world we are living in now where you've got to be open to signals and drivers, be creative in building hypotheses, be adventurous and creative and give yourself permission to experiment and to be creative. Do not penalize failure, iterate until you find something that works and then double down on whatever you find to build something amazing. You know, I've got a wonderful story I want to just share with you before I close off on that. It's, it's from a guy called Peter De, De Villiers, not the rugby coach who I, who I believe wasn't very good, but um, it's, it's a guy who built a, a really interesting um, company that he started out by, by basically trying to build a last minute dot com. And it was in the 1990s, 95, 96, 97. And he would, he would go to SAA and he would get these low cost airline tickets that they haven't been able to sell. And then he would email them to people and say, hey, look at this email, these half price uh, airline tickets, you've got to respond today. The problem was in 96, 97, 98, 99, nobody looked at their email more than once a week, hmm. right? And so the problem is that people wouldn't even realize. So, he, so his business was going down. So he said, I need a messaging system that will allow me, that people would look at immediately. And in 99, the only way to do that was to send bulk SMSs. So it didn't exist. There was no bulk SMSing system, he built one. Mm -hmm. He built this bulk SMSing system that allowed you to send, the company's called Clickertel, by the way. And he sent these out, he was able to bulk send SMSs to millions of people. Anyway, his airline business failed. But this bulk messaging system allowed him to build a billion rand business. He moved to Silicon Valley, did a fantastic job. You know, these companies were worth many billions of, of rands today. And Peter De Villiers moved back with his family back to South Africa, uh, which, I was, which blew me away. I was like, wow, well, you know, great story, right? But this is what I mean. Mm. He started out building something. The thing he was trying to build failed. He stumbled onto something else. He doubled down on that. And I've got a dozen stories, you know, hundreds of stories like this that I could mm. share with you. But that I think is the future. And these are the behaviors that we have to learn going, going forward.
which is a complete relearning for most people because yes, it is generally the very entrepreneurial person that tends to do something like this. And not even all entrepreneurs actually go through this experimental phase. And a lot of entrepreneurs fall in love with their own ideas and don't experiment and go straight to implementation and get burnt in the exactly. So even entrepreneurs have to unlearn in order to, to manage this kind of, or, or become really good at this kind of process. And then exactly the, right. whilst you're experimenting, you've still got to generate some revenue. And, and so you've got uh, the war, the, the raging war that, that is happening in trying to get used to this world that's unnormal. <laughs> I don't know, what's the opposite of normal? <laughs> We're abnormal. Never, abnormal, abnormal. Thank you. Cool. All right. So now we've got an idea of some kind of process that we, we need to be experimental. We need to be startups. We need to be preteens. This is sounding really good. <laughs> we have to play, <laughs> be okay to fail. So, so a lot of those, those skills is, is agility. So there's awareness, deep awareness. There's a listening skill. There's agility. There's an acceptance. And there's design thinking, it's experimental thinking, creativity. So a lot of different skill sets that's coming through there that um, I don't know, you're in the business world, are business schools teaching this kind of thing, Herman? As, I mean, are there any business schools right now that are even equipped for this kind of stuff? So let me share with you. I mean, I um, last week was my lecture on design thinking to my MBA group at the University of Johannesburg. Um, the week before that, uh, this week I'm talking about a lean startup, mm -hmm. which is exactly what I just described to you. Um, and so I think there are most business schools, I think, are teaching this stuff. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, uh, companies are embracing this. I'm working with uh, Philips in Holland now, and I'm taking groups of the executives through a process to basically help them design the next big thing in their healthcare business, their value chain business, their the uh, precision devices business. And so basically, uh, I'm also working with, with the company in Saudi Arabia, a big telco there. They recognize that over time, data is going to be free and voice is going to be free and text is going to be free. Mm. Well, duh, you know, like that's 99% of your business is going to be free. What are you going to be selling? Yeah. What are people going to pay you for exactly? And so, um, you know, all of these companies are having to pivot and they're all embracing. I'm starting to find corporate teams embracing design thinking, agile thinking, lean startup, it's starting to become baked in to the culture. But I have to be honest with you, it's heavy lifting, hey? I mean, it's uh, we, we spend hours working with uh, executive teams who are, you know, it, it, who are baked into the past. Yes. There's a wonderful paper written by Chris Argyris, and the, uh, the paper is why smart people can't learn mm. or why successful people can't learn. And what he says is, and Chris Argyris was a professor. He was with, with the uh, consulting, monitor consulting. He was a professor at Harvard Business School. And he, he basically describes the fact that the more successful you are and the smarter you are, the less likely you are to change. And the reason for that is you've convinced yourself that you're right because your brain is basically a con artist. It convinces you that you're right, number one. And number two, every, because you, you're so good and you're so smart and you're so successful, every time you succeed, it reinforces that belief system. Yeah. So what happens is smart, successful people find it impossible to change. And I, I, I promise you, I have battered my head against smart, successful people my whole life. And uh, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, I think the companies that they led have missed some phenomenal opportunities purely because the individual involved had a huge blind spot because of the way that they grew up. And it's, it's a function of the way the brain works, right? Mm -hmm. The way the brain works is there's a concept called neuroplasticity. I don't talk about it in the book, but neuroplasticity basically means that the brain is actually a malleable organ hmm. and you can lay down new brain tissue. Yeah. And if you, and, and I mean, we, all of us have done this, by the way, you know, I, I was at one stage, the fastest Blackberry user in South Africa, because I was able to type on that keyboard so fast. Look, I mean, to be fair, there were only three Blackberries in the country at the time, but I was the fastest. <laughs> and, so, and so what happened was, um, I, I'd, I'd used it so much that my brain actually was able to handle this BlackBerry while I was talking to someone I could carry on typing. And they say that if you spend 10,000 hours doing something, eventually your brain lays down enough brain tissue that your brain takes over what was previously conscious and turns into something unconscious. So people who play the violin don't think about playing the violin. 
They play the violin. The brain has now rewired itself to do unconsciously what was previously conscious. And I think that was, is what has to happen. We have to put humans through this process of rewiring our brains. In a sense, none of us are wired for this war. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the upside is we're, the, the playing fields have been leveled because we're all in the same boat. So, exactly. So, so let's all be happily stupid together right now and just relearn and, and, and create new smart ways of thinking. But don't ever believe that you're smart because it's going to mess you up again. <laughs> so it's a, a healthy dose of humility required in our world right now. Well put. Well put, come. So it's not all bad. I was very pleased to start turning the pages that started showing the positive signs <laughs> that's coming up. And some of them was people are, lo- many people don't want to go back to work. They're loving working from home. So they're loving it. Fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. What seemed like a crazy idea at first, people have got used to it. Yeah. Well, some digital firms are booming, of course, not all of them. Caterpillars are becoming butterflies. We're consuming less, which is a good thing. We're starting to appreciate the basics. We realize relationships. We had to be, we had to be disconnected from each other to realize how connected we, it, how important it is to be connected. Our earth has never been happier. Um, and, and so, so, so many things are becoming a realization in terms of the, the, the true things that matter. How can business take advantage of these kind of positives coming through in our world? Mm. Lovely question. Um, look, you know, the, part of the problem we have is, and I speak about that in the book as well, is the fact that we built an entire world economy is based on making people unhappy fundamentally. Is, is showing people how unhappy they are and making people unhappy with what they've got. We, we have a name for this field, it's called marketing. And the role of marketing is basically to create enormous fear of, of missing out amongst billions of people. Mm-hmm. Look at this car you don't have, look at this body you don't have, look at this face you don't have, look at the cell phone you don't have. It's all about, oh my word, I want that. Now, did you need it? No. Did you, do you want it now? Yes. Do you absolutely need it? Actually, you don't. And so, so part of, of, of the world is that part of the challenge in the world is we've built a world that's in a sense perverse because it's a, it's a world based on throw away, it's based on consumption, constant consumption, and it's based on massive destruction of the global environment and having huge factories pumping out stuff and polluting the world. Now, something happened in 1975 that's really instructive, which is in 1975, world GDP, you know, up until 1975, every time world GDP grew, the consumption of energy grew. And every time GDP grew, the consumption of commodities grew. In 1975, something odd happened. The GDP grew, but the consumption of energy flattened out. And uh, it, then what happened is um, GDP grew and the consumption of commodities flattened out. And the reason for that was we began to consume more services. And as we began to consume more services rather than products, we didn't need as many uh, co- commodities. And, we were, and also we started to recycle more. Going forward, I think that's the kind of thinking that's really going to drive the world going forward because we've got to now start thinking about how we define value. What is value actually? What are people willing to pay for? Uh, What is money actually? And if if, if America can just issue $1.5 trillion, it makes it meaningless, right? Because the money has no value if you can just make $1.5 trillion like, like that. So I think there's some fundamental shifts going on around what value is. And I think you're going to start to find we're going to be able to see a huge shift more into services. You're going to see a lot more businesses that are focused on softer skills that can't be automated. And I think we're going to see an acceleration in, in taking legacy businesses and automating them. The challenge that you're going to have is as prices drop and as jobs are lost because of automation, you're going to have an enormous number of people who become unemployed, right? Because they, you know, you don't need them anymore to do those analog jobs. And so what we have to do rapidly is to start finding these new industries, these new jobs that people are also willing to spend money on. So, you know, don't charge me per album. I'll pay, you know, $10 a month for music. I'm sorry that everybody at Look and Listen and Exclusive Books lost their jobs, but shouldn't you now be building the next thing? Shouldn't you be building curation? Shouldn't you be finding more artists? 
Mm. Shouldn't you know you, you should you start? Shouldn't you be tapping into the creativity of of art? Mm. Shouldn't you be building more schools to create more music? Shouldn't you be creating more genres? Shouldn't you be creating more authors? Because clearly we have an insatiable desire to consume content, and luckily content is now digital. And the minute content becomes digital, the cost of giving content to another consumer is zero, mm -hmm. because once I've written the once I've written the book, effectively the marginal cost of another reader is zero. Right, and once I've written the song and recorded it, the cost of giving it to the person is zero. So what we've got to start thinking about is this world where, for example, business schools. I'm a professor at two universities. I teach at five business schools around the world. I, I teach at probably 40 cities globally every year, and and probably more now because I'm doing it all re remotely. You know, education is a digital good. It's content. It, technically, once I've created my slide deck, I should give it to everybody for free. Because what should happen is if I can give this to everybody and everybody can learn this, someone's going to figure something amazing out that's going to change the world. This is the kind of mindset we need. We need to think about common goods. Air is a common good. Water is a common good. Security is a common good. Internet security is a common good. Fixing it makes it better for everyone. Mm -hmm. So we should all be working, working on building that common good. In my view, education is a common good. And so over time, what I think is going to happen we're going to start to build this, these number of common goods and we're going to really start to ask questions around where is value and that's where the jobs are going to migrate to and I think those jobs are going to be around human contact, humanity, the arts, the softer skills, you know, the kind of thing you and I are, are, are doing here, you know, uh, psychologists, therapists, this is where we are going to see it and sports, right, because we will, need, we will love sports going forward because it's so human. Yeah. I don't think we're ever going to see robots in there. <laughs> I hope that that kind of answers your, your question. That's an, an amazing answer to the question. And to my mind, that excites. I'd love to hear anyone listening to this, what they have to say about it. But to me, that's exciting because it's bringing humanity back. It's we're, we're, we're starting to move the non-essential kind of things that we've, that have just absorbed our time and stolen time from us. That's moving away. And we're, have this opportunity to redefine the fabric of society and the meaning and do things that really um, feed our, our spirits, which, which to, to my mind is, is, is amazing what you've, you've spoken about. Yes, of course, there's the change and we need to get through it. So and, and what you're speaking to is your idea of your value nets, which I found really uh, it's such, such a wonderful concept. And, and what we really need to be mindful of is because every, so many things are free, we have to put greater value out at competitive prices. And we need to become very good at this. And actually, we're going to put a lot of value out that's totally free. So this is going to change the landscape in every way. And some of the things that you spoke about was output pricing. Talk to us about this in the financial industry, Herman, because this is a place where People could sell us whatever and didn't have to fare well. We could actually lose money and they'd still make their fees. How is this going to change the financial services industry? Great question. You know, it's, um, I, I, I worked in the financial services industry directly or indirectly for 20 years. And what, what became very clear to me is, um, there, is that fundamentally it's, it's, a, it's a platypus, right, of note. Hmm. Right? Think about where, where, where banking started. Initially, Banks existed only to take a deposit to store your money for you because there was so much physical money that money would get destroyed. There would be a fire in a warehouse and people had their money there, it would get destroyed. And so banks said, give it to me, I've got a vault that's fireproof, I'll keep it for you. And money in those days were things like gold and silver and platinum. And so from that, we've now evolved into this weird creature that now does payments and it does lending and it does deposits and it does insurance. And, you know, and, and to justify our, our existence, we've come up with these really weird terms like bank assurance. None of this makes sense to consumers. And you can see it. Today, if I want to move money uh, around the world, I use PayPal. If I want to borrow money, I can go to LendingTree. If I want to uh, make an investment, I can go to, you know, to there's lots of, of, of startup companies where I can do crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. Uh, if I want to, um, you know, if I, if I want to finance my house, I can go to a, a bond originator. And so basically banks exist because they are intermediaries. Mm. The problem is that there've been three waves of disruption in the world. And one of those waves, the second wave 
was disintermediation. And so banks are, are really threatened. There's so many, there are hundreds of thousands of startups coming after banks and they are cherry picking this bank from the outside in. Eventually what happens is as they chew away at the base of the bank, the bank's gonna fall over. And, and, and central banks in every country in the world have a real worry about this because over time, we don't want banks to go bust. We need them to survive. And what do we do with the fact that Standard Bank employs 55,000 people? These are good people. They, 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 they all have you know, families to support. What are we going to do? So I, I feel that you know, it's a lot like, like Eskom. Having a lot of people employed to do nothing effectively is what we've got in the, in the power generation industry is where we're going to end up within banking, right? If you're not careful, because we don't need these huge banks to exist. What we want are the processes. I can take these processes, put them through 10 startups. I don't need the bank. Mm -hmm. And people say, oh, but you know, are, those, are, are they going to be around? And how long are they going to be there for? And can you trust them with your money? All of this is true. But you know what? I trust. My mother told me, never get into a car with a stranger. <laughs> right? Today, I do that all the time with Uber. Why? <laughs> right? Why? Because I have a trust network. Mm -hmm. And as we build trust networks, we trust each other more than we trust a bank. So in the past, the way that you got trust was, we've got this great bank, we've, we are 155 years old, doesn't matter anymore, right? Go and read what people are saying about these companies, they hate these companies. Mm -hmm. But go and see what people are saying about Airbnb and who the best host is, who the best driver is, we trust people like us. And so where the world is shifting to is we starting to trust each other, human contact and real human people who put real comments, we trust far more then we trust a company yelling at you saying, look at me with my new slogan and my new fancy head office. So I think what's gonna happen in the world is we are gradually moving away from these big corporates shouting at you, you know, and, and really in a sense, they're thumping their chest mm -hmm. to, to companies who are actually delivering value, who are getting great ratings from consumers who, and who are getting up the scoreboard from, with customer satisfaction and over time will get the trust. So I think the, the financial services institution have to get into that game. And then what they've got to do is they've got to spin off some of their, their business units in the same way that AT&T spun off many of their businesses in the past and NASPAS is spinning it off as well. You have to spin these businesses off, get it a smaller company. Um, and actually there's too many people at, at head office actually at most banks. And their job is to manage this enormous friction because the company has become too, too complicated to manage. Mm -hmm. So I think my, my sense is over time, these banks are, are going to disaggregate. There'll be a payment organization. There'll be a, a transactional organization. There'll be a lending organization. There'll be a credit card organization. And they'll have to compete on a par with some of these startups. If you don't do that, eventually we will all have credit cards from startups. We'll have payday loans from startups. We'll have bonds from startups and the banks will have nothing. And the problem is, you know, they say change occurs slowly. Then it occurs very, very quickly. When banks get hollowed out like this, you're going to start seeing bank collapses globally that are going to pull down the entire banking industry. So it's really important that banks understand now that they're getting eaten from the outside in and they either must buy those startups and absorb that, but consumers are expecting Spotify, Netflix, Google, Facebook type services from banks. Mm -hmm. And you better get there fast, right? And, and I think banks are just taking too long to get there, but that's just banks. I, I work with banks all over the world. I give them this message constantly. And I think bankers are getting it. The problem is, you know, it's, it's very difficult to transform a platypus, right? Very, it's tough. It's tough making that transition. So, but I think they're getting there. And I think, you know, I think that they, they need people like you to really get in there, change that mindset, get more coaching. And a lot of it's about changing mindset. I must be honest with you, that getting over that resistance to this change that's coming our way. Absolutely. I do work a lot with Standard Bank. So, uh, and, I, and I love working with them, actually. They're, they're my bank, and I love them as well. But th this is the message I'm giving to them. And, and, and it, it needs to be loud and clear because, sure, it's for, for such a massive, massive banks to fall uh, or crumble around us with so many employees in it, that's scary times for far too many people. So if we're on the Titanic, which we literally are right now, we can't move deck chairs. We have to move the iceberg. And this is exactly what you're talking about now in terms of the banks. We can't just move some deck chairs. We've got to really yeah. look at what's underneath the water. Thanks for that, Herman. For an entrepreneur who is agile, who is innovative, who does add value, the prospects look pretty good. 
um, give us give us your outlook in terms of the SME going into the future. Yeah, in, in, in my mind, the world is heading towards a massive disaggregation. In, in other words, it's becoming more atomic, more granular. These big monoliths are breaking down. And it's wonderful news for us, right? For us as small, small businesses. You, you know, what's great about COVID is, is I would try to sell a remote service into the United States, Singapore. I, I don't know, I'm trying to think we have work lately, you know, Holland, England, uh, India, Saudi Arabia, Dubai. I would have, uh, uh, Zimbabwe. And people would have said, fly here. And I would say, no, I'll do it on Zoom. <laughs> no, 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 no. You get your ass here now. Get onto a plane, get your ass. Today, there's no hesitation to doing it like this. Yeah. Now that for me is an enormous, enormous opportunity for SMEs because basically the world is your oyster. So, so basically I think there's an opportunity for SMEs to work globally now. And that's what COVID has done. You yeah. can live in South Africa. Yes, there's issues. I'm not, I'm not, look, I'm not papering over the big problems we have in this country. But I'm saying, I think as SMEs, especially in this region in the world, we have an astonishing low, low cost base. We can undercut anyone. We have the right accent. We're in the right time zone, right? I, I, I'm not kidding you. People think, you know, we've got amazing accents. I'm waiting for people to say South African accent is the sexiest accent in the world. Because I'm telling you, people love my accent glo globally. Why? The Aussies love it because it's not American. The Americans love it because it's not British. The British love it because it's not American. The <laughs> Europeans love it because, you know, we've got this really weird, unusual accent and people love it, right? And we enunciate really well in South Africa, actually. If you speak English well in South Africa, the world's gonna love you. And we in South Africans, we, we work hard. So I, you know, for me, just for professional services, the world's your oyster, go onto LinkedIn, find customers, undercut those guys from you know, developed countries. Mm -hmm. You can deliver your services everywhere. No one has an excuse to be unemployed if you're in professional services. Get out there, form your small company and get those customers. It's much cheaper to do that than to hire full-time staff. And so I'm starting to find a lot of that, you know, the gig economy is taking off in a big way. People are, are, are now contracting for pieces of work. Mm -hmm. So to, you know, today, a, a typical person may have 200 contracts to, in order to earn his annual salary, he'll probably earn the same money he was earning in a corporate, have a much better life, pay less taxes and learn more. So, I, so for me, we're in a great space just in terms of, of the knowledge business. I think there's a wonderful opportunity to build content businesses right now. So you know, if, you're, if you're in the business of content, fantastic, leverage that, double down. If you're not in the business of content, if you can speak well, if you're good at producing content. I mean, I was looking for a, a studio the other day to record some stuff for a UK client. I think, I think TV studios, you know, recording studios, uh, voice studios, um, voice artists, uh, video artists are gonna really be coming to their own because we're all gonna start creating content. We're gonna put it onto YouTube. There's so many ways now to monetize your intellect, your personality, your, your, your IP and your assets. And then of course, you know, these big companies are, are really struggling to get agile. And so small companies have always had this huge agility opportunity. What we've got to now do is figure out a way, and this problem I have to be concede has not been solved. We've got to figure out a way that big companies can work better with small companies. Mm. That, that problem is not solved. If we can get past this business of please register as a vendor and there's 500 pages of documents. Absolutely. You've been there, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the bullshit rules again. <laughs> bullshit rules, yeah. yeah. So, so, so my sense is, the, the SMEs have a wonderful opportunity in front of them if they can go out there and look for the pain points. You know, I, I like looking at, at kind of three things when it comes to opportunities. The first thing I always say to people is first, look at the jobs that your customer have to complete every day. What are the, you know, you're a bank, you've got to get customers, bank customers, register customers, you know, kick out cash, these are jobs. Then you've got to figure out for those jobs, what are the pains and what are the gains? What are the pain points? Where's the friction? What can you do to relieve the pain? And then where are the opportunities where they are not leveraging it, where you know there's a gain, that if they did this thing differently, they could make a lot more, more money or lower cost or improve customer satisfaction. Um, and I, I, so those three words, jobs, gains, and pains are great words. Mm. You want to really grow your, your, your SME business, focus on those three things. In my MBA classes, I, I, I hammer that, those three words, every lecture, I'm like, Guys, just focus on job pains and gains. You can build a successful business. 
So I was going to ask you, what's the most important question either an entrepreneur or executive needs to ask themselves right now? And I think maybe you've just answered, unless there's a different question to ask, ask to identify the opportunities. Well, I guess, you know, jobs, pays and gains for me is really, is really huge. The second thing I guess is you really need to understand what business you're in. I, I, I'll be honest, I, I think too many people that I talk to don't understand what business they're in. You know, I was talking to the guys at kind of Philips and they said to me, you know, Herman, we're in the business of electric toothbrushes. And actually they are now monitoring the plaque on your teeth while you brush your teeth. They tell you when, you, when to stop brushing. You keep brushing until that light goes out, right? And then they monitor the condition of your teeth and they upload it into your dental records that your dentist can see. Then they analyze the condition of your saliva and your gums. And because it's the most intrusive object we have, right? I mean, we've got nothing else that's as intrusive as a toothbrush. It's so <laughs> intrusive, we don't even share it with other people. Please tell me if you don't share it with other people. Right? So, so, and we take this thing, we put it into our mouth, right? Which is actually, if you think about it, a very intimate act. Yes. And then why don't you now take this and I do it like twice a day. Well, gather information, tell my doctor, tell my dentist, tell me, how am I doing, yeah. right? And so all of a sudden, Philips is saying, we're not an appliance company, mm. we're a healthcare company. Yeah. Well, that's amazing, that's mind blowing. I, I mean, really, you, you wanna go out there and buy uh, Philips shares because in my view, that is such a huge opportunity. We are, we are all gonna get older, we are all gonna need these kinds of tools this is a growing, enormous growing market. You want to be in the healthcare industry going forward. And so businesses that pivot into, into that space early and learn how to make use of data and customer behavior, mm -hmm. I think are, are going to get to the future faster. And that, that's what you want to do to kind of overcome these forces that are attacking you. Either you do it or one of these startups is, is going to do it going for to do. you. Incredible, amazing um, insights and tools and, and questions that we need to ask. What totally excites you about the future that's, that's here already now? Well, I think the fact is, the fact for me is that the tools of the future are here. The manifestation of how it's going to change our lives is yet to be developed. Hmm. So in a sense, the, the hand is writing, but it's not completed. We can shape what it writes. Mm. And for me, that's very exciting. You know, I have the, uh, I love teaching because I, and I, because I, I can shape young minds and I can help executives and, you know, and I can, I can, one person can shape the thinking of maybe 50,000 people. I mean, this year, I think 10 million people will read my, my posts on, on LinkedIn. You know, that, that's 10 million people I've touched in some way. For me, that's, I find that enormously fulfilling and exciting and people go, wow, this is so amazing. You've given me a thought, you've helped me with this. Wow, I'm glad I read this, this is changing something. In a way, I'm that little, that little, I guess, I don't know, that little consciousness that's, that's moving people and helping them pivot, that little push. And if there's enough of us doing that, we can move the entire planet. You know, um, Atlas said, if you give me a place to stand, I'll move the entire planet. For me, that's LinkedIn, right? Yeah. I can move this planet in my little way. And I think that's very exciting. The fact that if we embrace this concept of sharing, you know, I share seven times a day, I share for free. Right, I'm giving away ideas every day. And I'm saying, guys, did you think about this? What about this? Th think about this, shouldn't we change this? And people all over the world, you know, only one quarter of my, of my readers are in South Africa. 75% of my readers, of my 10 million people who read it, are outside of South Africa. And so you build up this base. I'm not trying to monetize it. What I'm trying to do is get those 10 million people to embrace this battle that's taking place, take part in it, and shape the outcome of that battle. That for me is very exciting. I think for the world overall, it's exciting for me. You know, people don't get this, but the, the middle-class consumer today has a life better than that of kings 200 years ago. You know, you've got more music, more books, more videos, more entertainment. You've got a better quality of life, better healthcare, a longer lifespan, more food, you know, more of everything than kings had. And somehow we're still unhappy. Mm -hmm. right? And that's the function of marketing. As I said to you, the role of marketing is to make you extremely unhappy about what you've got and, and make you, you know, unhappy about what you could have. Mm -hmm. So for me, the opportunity is to be happy with what we've got. We've got to dial down this marketing. We've got to stop trying to sell people new things, get them to be happy with where they are, get them to feel fulfilled and help to build the new. 
you know, and for me, that new is just so interesting. A world where, you know, where we start sharing things to help the world become a better place and where business opportunities evolve that are more natural than the kinds of businesses that are very unnatural that we've built today. So for me, it's a fundamental reshaping of the world. I, I am concerned about things like deep fakes and, uh, you know, the way that the world is polarizing between the left wing and the right wing and liberals and, and, and you know, the, the radical right and, and the populists. We, we do need to create a center that will hold. And for me, that is, I think, the key thing, the key role. You know, if you ask me, I mean, what would you like to see as an outcome? I would like to see an elimination of this polarization. It's, it's it, you know, in, in creative thinking, we teach, get rid of either or, yes. get rid of yes, but. Hmm. Introduce the word yes, and. Yes, yes. And, yes and, and inclusivity hmm. is what's missing in the world right now. People feel pulled to the left or the right, there's nothing at the center. Yes. For me, I think the center needs to be reestablished. You know, we went to the moon because the center held, right? Hmm. We need to go back to the moon because the center holds. Humans can dream big things, but only when we are united. When we are separate, we focus on fighting each other. Mm. When we are united, we focus outside on bigger things. And that's where we must get back to. Mm. Which is exactly the ethos of the show, which is the, what you're talking to is that bringing the humanity right back into the center, the sharing, the collaborating, the meaningful stuff, the inclusiveness, the depolarization if, if you can exactly say. i like that word and yeah. that's a good word <laughs> word of the day well done that's a very good word devolution depolarization yes indeed Demolition, yes final message if you were able to speak to every human on the planet what would you want to share right now yeah, you know, I, I'm a Star Trek and a Star Wars fan. So for me, the thing about Star Trek that always appealed to me was, you know, there's no money in Star Trek. Money never existed. And, you know, there are 250 episodes of, of one of the series, Voyager. There are probably 500 to 600 different episodes of Star Trek. And in none of those episodes does money exist. Mm. And for me, you know, the creators of Star Trek I, th I think had a, you know, Gene Roddenberry, who was the original author of the series, uh, the late Gene Roddenberry, who inspired it. He had this dream of a world that didn't need money to, to validate itself. And so money exists for really one or two very simple things. What if you could produce everything for free? Well, then you wouldn't need money. And for me, I, I would like a discourse on this whole concept of money, because for me, the fact that you can just create money and destroy money and Money is the root of all evil, fundamentally. And really, money, to a large extent, is about getting access to things and getting access to power and visibility. And it's really more, it's, it's, it's about ego, really, you know. And so the, the real thing that has to happen in the world is we've got to manage this ego, move away from money, and start looking at ways that we can build an economy that doesn't focus on uh, enrichment of the minority, right? We've got to figure out a way that we can create and, and wealth, a new form of wealth, which is well-being rather than pure wealth for the majority. And we should define success as the maximum well-being of the majority, that is the definition of success, not the enrichment of the minority. And if we could pull that off, that is the journey that I want to be on. And, and fundamentally, there's something wrong with the way that, that neoliberal economics have been structured, which really have enriched the minority. That's, it's, it's crazy to me that people can have you know, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, you know, 150 or 100 billion dollars. I mean, how many pizzas can you eat a day? How many cars can you drive a day? How many beds can you sleep in a day? How many TVs can you watch? How many houses can you live in? You know, the fact of the matter is these things are immoral, mm. right? And so, they, you know, I think we need, we, need to, we need to, as a society, recognize that this is immoral and make it immoral. It should be embarrassing mm. to have more than you can consume. Yes. You fix that problem, we can really get this, this planet back on track. Thank you. And I think after everything that you've shared with such absolute passion is when we really look at it, the essence of what your book is telling us is that, yes, we're in, we're in a war zone. However, let's embrace this war because what follows, as you said, you, we've, got, we've got the pen in the hand, but we can shape what we're writing. And it's really beautiful. So 
we can shape where this war goes. And from it can be this, this incredible new world. It, it can be a place that we really want to be in. And, and what you also said right now is what wealth should be and what success should be is maximum well-being of the majority. What an incredible world we have the opportunity to shape right now. Thank you so much for your insights, Herman. Thank you for writing the book. And thank you for sharing with millions of people already. And um, I, I, I really hope that this episode also shapes more minds into thinking, okay, actually, this is chaos, this is, but it's great chaos. It's the best time of, of, of humanity to, to actually be alive, to shape the future. Thank you so much for your time and your insights, and I uh, wish you the greatest uh, success going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carmen. Thanks for the time on your show, and uh, I really hope that the, the audience takes something useful out of this as well. Thank you. And uh, as a closing note there, Let's go create solutions. We have a number of challenges, but if we collaborate instead of compete and we co-create solutions and then we celebrate every single success on the way to reshaping this amazing future that we have, then we can write a new human story. Mm -hmm.